Um, this is, as Michelle says, uh, our first Tuesdays uh, event for October. And uh, what we usually do is focus on, on political books of one kind or another, books that have either been unfairly attacked or uh, wrongly overlooked. And what, what usually happens at these events, you know, because so many horrible things have been happening so relentlessly uh, for the last, I don't know what, 10 years at least, <laughs> that invariably, uh, you know, some horrible thing has happened the day of the talk that is relevant to the book, you know? So that gives me a, a, a way to introduce the talk, a kind of mordant spirit, you know? And, uh, oh, it's a good thing we can hear from this. And it's kind of, it's kind of depressing, but you think, well, you know, oh, Jesus. Those of you who've been to the others, you know, both of you uh, have, have, heard, have heard this. Well, actually, this is a different event tonight because it seems to me that um, the mood is, is different uh, no less relevant to tonight's uh, talk than previous events. Uh, but the spirit has changed because what's been happening lately is, is very hopeful and, and completely unexpected and couldn't be more relevant to what uh, Chris is going to talk about. So um, let me introduce Chris Lehman, uh, an old friend of mine, trained as a historian, uh, and uh, experienced as a journalist, a great historian and a great journalist. Uh, not only does he have this uh, new expanded edition of his book, Rich People Things, out, but he's also got the uh, cover story in the latest issue of Harper's Magazine, which is about the you know, Mormon economic uh, basis of the Republican Party. So um, he's going to talk informally. I'm going to sit up here with him so he'll feel loved. Uh, and then he'll take your questions. But I do want to, I want to reemphasize one thing that Michelle said. Uh, uh, Haymarket is his publisher. It's a small press. This event is taking place in the McNally Jackson Bookstore, which is an independent bookstore. What I'm getting at is it would be thrilling if you would not only sit through his talk and participate and ask questions, but actually buy a copy when it's over. And Chris will be glad to sign it. So please uh, join me in welcoming Chris Lehman. Thank you. I think uh, this, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know the state of the other history being made than uh, at Zuccotti Park, but it is a historic occasion when Mark Crispin Miller and Chris Lehman are the augurs of hope. <laughs> um, and it does totally kind of fuck with, you know, my conventional book presentation because I'm supposed to be telling, as Mark had indicated, um, you know, sort of reveling perversely in all the many ways the money culture has distorted our politics, has created, you know, intolerable or what should be intolerable gaps in wealth inequality. Um, and um, perverted our most basic um, forms of political expression. But <laughs> we know that there is a new kind of political expression taking place not far from here, and it is um, a good occasion to revisit some of um, what could be teased out as um, more, if not hopeful, then less mordant, um, analytic themes in the book. Um, and I don't have any formal presentation. I, I, uh, as is often the case, though, um, when you write about a topic like um, the savage inequalities of our political life, um, topics assail you every day. <laughs> you get up in the morning, and uh, you know that's often how I wrote the column based on, on on which the book is based, I, you know, have a very unhealthy relationship with like the Sunday New York Times and, you know, would pick up the magazine or the Sunday style section or the business section and just before I had my column would just, you know, silently fulminate in my head and, and gnash my teeth and uh, wonder what I could do and, and eventually I wound up doing this online column that still didn't pay, but I figured was cheaper than therapy. 
and uh, and it then metamorphosed into a book that still doesn't pay, but is still very uh, um, a useful platform on which to try to think through a lot of these issues because you know writing about social class in particular in contemporary America is to be constantly engaged with a taboo subject. In the introduction of the book, book I kind of describe um, so the experience of social class in America as akin to the idea of sex in Catholic school. That uh, it's something that's not supposed to exist, but when you realize it's there, you suddenly notice it everywhere. And there is, you know, in the same way that, you know, <laughs> the entire uh, Catholic school tradition is designed to repress the thought of sex. We have an entire political tradition in this country that's designed to repress the thought of social class. And so we have these weird formations that develop. Uh, we have a you know Republican Party that is devoted primarily to cutting taxes for the wealthy that is positioned in our political debate as populist, as though the original populists were members of the People's Party and people who claim that tradition should notionally be representing, you know, I'm not that fastidious about language, but they should be trying to express the interests of some sort of majority, right? That's like a baseline, you know, people. Um, and so, you know, that's just one very common um, perversion of language and thought that we, we now just take for granted. I mean, we see Sarah Palin or we see Herman Cain or uh, Mitt Romney, who is like, you know, a second generation millionaire. Uh, Mitt, Mitt Romney at the last presidential debate was, you know, uh, his Fox interlocutor who, who looks like an inflatable boy. I forget his name, Brett somebody. Um, asked him, uh, what's your definition of, of rich? You know, and, uh, and Mitt was, you know, and this is what our political system writ large, kind of how it tries to handle this awkward question, right? Because uh, Mitt Romney, first of all, can't say like, I'm the definition of rich, <laughs> which is the obvious answer. Um, so he then, you know, went off on this sort of weird tangent of like, there are, you know, I don't want to talk about people who aren't rich. We all should be rich in America. Which, first of all, echoes John Jacob Raskob, who is head of the Democratic Party in the fateful year of 1928, wrote a piece in, um, I think it was some, some women's magazine called Everybody Ought to Be Rich. And like four months later, the stock market collapsed. <laughs> so I would first of all say, any anytime someone tells you that everyone can or should be rich, that's a sell indicator. <laughs> um, but also, you know, when you think about a statement like that, it's mathematically impossible. <laughs> if, if everyone, you know, I was about to say if everyone is rich, no one is rich, which is sort of true because everyone would be consuming vast amount of resources and engorged somehow, I guess. And, um, but there would be a massive, um, depletion of the natural world. There would be populations starved. And here, I'm getting, I'm getting to the downer part again. You know what's going to happen. Um, you know, rich, rich people necessitate the existence of poor people. And that's the thing our political culture cannot accept or process. Um, and so we never talk about what happens to people who become less rich, you know, social mobility is always presumed to be continually rising the same way that class warfare is always supposed to be coming from the bottom up. And of course, War I quote Warren Buffett even before the R Buffett rule, <laughs> which by the way, I'll just pause and notice another perversion when you have a sort of populist campaign undertaken by the Democratic Party to marginally increase uh, marginal tax rates on the people making more than a million dollars and it's named after a billionaire. <laughs> like, what is, just think of what that tells you about the way we talk about these issues, right? Um, but, uh, 
see, now I, I forgot what I was saying. Um, oh yeah, there, just, you know, the idea that um, you cannot have um, a society where everyone is rich. It's mathematically impossible. Um, and uh, I was also reminded of this, again, this is, this is kind of the crass Tom Friedman, this happened in my cab kind of metaphor or anecdote. Um, but thanks to my publisher, Anthony Arno, who's in back today, I was uh, literally um, awakened by a, a phone call to initiate a, a radio interview before. It was like 6.20 in the morning, and I admit I'd kind of forgotten about it. Um, and so it was, first of all, like every anxiety dream you would have rolled into one, right? You are like grasping for your phone, you haven't had coffee, and you are on the air with theoretically with thousands of people listening to you trying to gain consciousness. Um, but uh, the, uh, and the interviewer asked me about the, uh, the book subtitle, which in this edition is called uh, is Real Life Secrets of the Predator Class. And he said like, so what, it, what do you mean by that? Why, why would you call you know, the rich predators? Um, and I couldn't tell him what was the actual truth, which is that Anthony wanted a subtitle and I just made it up on the spot. <laughs> um, so I gave, I, and again, under these conditions, I gave an answer I can't summon to mind right now and wasn't articulated in the first place. But, uh, but I did think about it later, like why, why did I choose that word? And, and I think it's that same idea that, uh, you know, it's a social class in America is a zero sum proposition in many ways. People get life chances from certain material arrangements and other people can't have them. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I'm putting that more starkly and more in a more Malthusian way than I actually believe, but I think it's important to insist on these kind of points because you can't get at ideas like equality without acknowledging, yeah, there, you know, when 1% of the population controls 40% of the nation's wealth, that is a kind of predation. People are not only taking an outsized share of our collective resources, but again, they've erected institutional structures. They have, a, you know, a, a sort of media echo chamber that permits Mitt Romney to say these asinine things and go and question. Um, and uh, there's a whole political culture devoted to this. And, and the book is an effort in uh, sort of um, impressionistic and uh, essay um, form to tease out what, what that political culture looks like if you think of it differently. If you don't think, you know, that meritocracy, for example, is, you know, is or should be the ideology that organizes achievement in our country. Uh, or that David Brooks is, is a you know kind of social prophet who um, points the way toward a, a kind of um, high educated high consumption utopia or that um, you know Malcolm Gladwell spots trends that will turn us all into sort of uh, successful middle managers. Um, and, you know, the, the cumulative effect, at least for, I don't know what it's like for anyone who, uh, who reads the book, because having written it, I, don't, I never want to look at it again. But uh, uh, I'm kidding. Buy it. It makes a great gift. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you do sit down to, and go through this kind of exercise, you suddenly realize, like, there's a real derangement here that people... You know, and it's in many ways it's a language problem, which is again what the I idea of the, the predator class, you know, inadvertently summoned forth in, in this morning's interview is like, why is it that um, it's you know presumably there's something shocking or controversial about 
calling the wealthy in our country predators? Um, and why is it that, you know, <laughs> just to take another random example from our political culture this week, like when Rick Perry has a, a racial a farm with a racial slur that was once prominently dis, uh, displayed on it, everyone is hysterical about the inappropriate playing of the race, you know? There is this weird um, imbalance in the way that we talk and think about um, wealth and class and social opportunity in our in our country. And I think, you know, it's regrettable in a lot of ways, but you do have to go back to the basic level of language and thinking about, you know, casting these ideas in different terms. Um, you know, meritocracy, for example, is a perfect example. We all, it's part of our folk religion, basically, in the United States, that we, if we aren't meritocracy, that is damn well our social ideal, our gospel, that everyone can and should be rewarded on the basis of individual merit, achievement, standardized tests, um, you know, civil service type promotions. Again, there's a whole institutional structure that's supposed to support this ideal. But the problem is, historically speaking, meritocracy was a, uh, and I, I love this, <laughs> uh, a term coined by a British socialist and a satirical novel called The Rise of the Meritocracy. And uh, it is quite deliberately and quite unmistakably, if you read the novel, meant to describe a system of uh, intensely unequal social relations papered over by the appearance of neutral achievement. So, and they have you know these wonderful phrases like, you know, uh, manual workers are, are uh, I think, given muscle money, <laughs> and uh, there's a core of. Uh, you know, the rebel, this is a dystopian novel and it's all set in a, what was then a 21st century future. And uh, of course, what happens under Michael Young's vision of meritocracy is you have sort of the David Brooks world where uh, there are all these kind of like, you know, turbo shopping, high achieving yuppies who, who uh, have great professional credentials and careers and talk to each other at cocktail parties and you know, redo their kitchens or whatever the fuck it is. And, uh, and uh, then you have this vast class of people who, who you know, don't test out. And they become, they become uh, maid servants and manual workers. And they eventually, um, in, in the novel, start a revolution that winds, winds up claiming the life of our sober social scientific narrator. Um, and it occurs to me that that's probably, in some ways, a suitably hopeful note on which to uh, to end my informal remarks and uh, open the floor up for any questions you might have. And of course, to urge you all to go down to uh, Zuccotti Park and, and take part in, uh, in uh, Occupy Wall Street, where I'm told, actually, that uh, my book is, is there in the People's Library or whatever it's called, which of course still means no one's fucking buying it, but <laughs> it's a small sacrifice I make for the greater good, which you can help remedy tonight. Anyway, um, that's all I got. So thanks for coming out and um, let's talk if you like. Can, can you tell us what show you did this morning? <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> Actually, Anthony mentioned it this morning when I met him today, and I was like, what are you talking about, dude? Wake-up call. Yes, the wake-up call. Wake call. I took it too literally. Well, what? what? WBAI. WBAI. Oh, WBAI. Yeah, yeah. And I... WBAI, they did I asked you why you called them the predator class? I, I mean no harm by mentioning any of this. It was just... No, no, no. no it was just all came friends. to me in the fog of, of my awakening. Okay. Um, Somebody I had, yeah. Can you give us an insight into how these people in the 1%, how they think, how they view the rest of us? Yeah. <laughs> Repeat the yes, yes. Um, the question is, can I give some insight into uh, 
how the the one per, people in the one percent who control forty percent of the wealth think and view the rest of us. Uh, I guess the the cheeky answer would be I ideally wish I could because that would mean I would be really rich. <laughs> All right. Um, but in some ways, I guess the the book is intended in part to elicit that very um, answer. Um, that there are ideologies out there and, and what we take for just kind of benign uh, features of our pop culture and our political culture and our economic thinking that actually represent the interests of that 1%. And, uh, and I think you can, you know, um, it's a little less cheeky to put it this way, but I think you can watch any of the, the current GOP presidential debates and get a very strong sense. I mean, that Mitt Romney response gives you a very strong sense of basically saying, like, don't ask me what it means to be rich because I, I don't want to believe in the existence of inequality because it's inconvenient. Um. Uh, could it be that uh, rich and poor assets are not the best way to talk about and try to understand the rich and the poor. And this may be one of the problems you have with the people who ask, why did you call the rich the predator class? If you look at a dictionary for rich and poor, you find uh, two dictionaries I've consulted. You can see a, a pretty clear picture of what it is to be rich without introducing the notion of poor. Mm -hmm. And the same holds for poor. You get a pretty clear picture of what's involved in being poor without introduce, introducing the notion of rich. Because what they're focusing on is how much money they make, uh, maybe lifestyle, uh, right. things of this sort. Uh, which is why class is generally used to refer to people insofar as they have a particular function in production. Right. And if you talk about the workers, for example, and understand workers, not just in terms of industrial workers, but in terms of people who have to sell their labor power mm -hmm. in order to survive, uh, which means the 90, 95% of the population in our country. Then the rich enter into the picture, well, what you're calling the rich, mm -hmm. enter into the picture right away because if they, are, if they in turn are looked at in terms of their function right. in production, these are the people who do the hiring, and part of what makes them rich, the biggest part, has to do with how little they can get away paying the workers that they've hired, and how little they can spend on making work comfortable, safe, uh, even attractive, interesting, and also on uh, uh, other ways that they uh, it, it imposes their interests on the people they hire, which makes them richer and richer. Right. So, ri so capitalist and worker is a much more useful way of understanding the very people that you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. And, and predator class then mm -hmm. becomes a very accurate description of mm -hmm. the people you're calling rich. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not going to repeat that question. But <laughs> um, <laughs> But the gist of it was, um, are, are rich and poor really the most useful sort of analytic terms to describe the phenomenon of social class and wealth inequality? And yeah, they are imprecise. I think capitalists and worker have issues too, um, both descriptively and politically. I think, you know, we're in a, you know, I, I resist all the propaganda surrounding it, but, you know, a lot of our economy now is somewhat knowledge-based, and you know, part of part of the anxiety around all of these issues are, uh, you know, has to do with a lot of us. It's very hard to know what value we create, and I don't mean that pejoratively. You know, I'm sure everyone here is creating value all the time, and I, as a journalist, I create nothing of worth. So, um, but there is this kind of sense of. You know, we have to, you know, and that's where you get this intense, you know, again, you see it in the Tea Party Ride and, and in devotees of Ayn Rand. What we are calling the capitalists are always wealth creators, right? They're kind of these demigods who, who descend and, and take raw materials and, and create hideous mo modernist architecture out of them. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I would say there's a certain amount of projection going on in, in that um, word choice. Um, and I think the thing with capitalist and worker is, um, you know, the, the, the traditional Marxist 
um, categories of analysis are hard to reclaim. Um, and I'm sure people here will, will disagree with me, and people at Zuccotti Square would disagree with me, but, you know, I. And I think, especially in our country, which lacks a feudal tradition, all these things that, you know, if you've studied the um, history of socialism in America are, are valid. Um, you know, I do think there is, because we had an abundance of, of land and raw materials when the Republic was, and the frontier was conquered and all that, um, there wasn't a strong um, self-understanding in our political tradition of workers as workers. Everyone thought, bought into some version of the success myth that one day, you know, um, you know, you, you will be, uh, an industrialist will lift you out of the mailroom and, and make you a millionaire yourself. Or our modern day version of it, which is the, the David Brooksian meritocracy myth. Um, but I, I, again, it was funny when I was thinking back on this early morning radio question, I also reminded myself that there, you know, um, during the immediate aftermath of the mortgage meltdown, there was all this, you know, agita on the right about the idea of predatory lending, which is a common self-evident thing. <laughs> if you actually look at the way that uh, the banks went about um, securitizing mortgages after the, you know, they sort of ran out of rich suburban fodder. Um, uh, in the housing market, and um, there were all the, I think I quote one in the book, there, there are these hilarious efforts to like deny that banks are acting in a predatory fashion because, you know, God damn it, when, you know, the loan was finally liquidated, they were stuck with this, you know, this stranded asset, this, this you know, mortgage that was no longer any value. And of course, that eliminates all the entire other side of the ledger, which was on basis points, these same financial institutions went into the global investment market, you know, chopped these mortgages up into tranches and made enormous profits. And again, this is what I'm talking about when you, you get these kind of rhetorical depictions of the experience of wealth and class in our, in our country, you're only getting one half of the picture, you know. Obviously, yeah, when, when Lehman Brothers was overextended, um, they were allowed to go under and, and then all the other, you know, and this is where perhaps the capitalist designation does make sense. Like the, the lords of finance capital did <laughs> actually form a kind of conspiracy <laughs> and uh, got themselves bailed out by Timothy Geithner, who's never held a real job in his life and was the former head of the New York Fed. And Larry Summers was there because he decent, you know, deregulated the, um, the com commodity futures market in the first place and helped engineer the, uh, the ruinous, um, you know, uh, destruction of the Glass-Steagall law. So in that sense, I just, you know, I guess I just feel like when you use the word capitalist, like it's the, like the whole thing about calling the White House an Obama socialist, like the, these terms just get thrown around so promiscuously and so inaccurately, I, I kind of resist it. And I, I didn't, again, the whole America is somewhat different. I think a pot, you know, even though I was making fun of the way populism has gotten distorted in our present situation, I think populism is probably a more, is a, a term of analysis that's easier to reclaim than socialism. And populism is sort of about producers. Uh, it just included the kind of a small land holding petty bourgeoisie that Marx hated. <laughs> Um, but I, I think, you know, there is something, and again, you see it right now on, on Occupy Wall Street, there is a very direct sense of like, these are people who are, you know, out of work or been foreclosed upon. They're not, you know, I mean, there are some hipsters who are just like getting high and forming drum circles or whatever, but, but especially as of tomorrow, when I urge you all to go down. Uh, the unions are coming out in full force, and you will see a very different face. And these are people who work for a living, and you know the symbolism is very stark. They're out in the street. They're locked out of the banks. Um, and that, that whatever you, whatever terms you want to use to describe that situation, I think that is what I hope comes out of this moment. That you know people will look at the Occupy Wall Street movement on the evening news and recognize themselves in the crowd. 
Um, that's uh, anyway. Just about about the Yakai Wall Street. Um, previous instances of this sort of movement have been turned against itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully this will somehow change. But my sense is that you know people are watching this and they have a strategy in place to kind of counteract this populist thing. Maybe you must be watching for it. I mean, they mm -hmm. being um, the Lords of Capital. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. um, who, what things could you imagine possibly happening? What what things could uh, the Wall Street do to try to avoid it? Uh, the question is, what things could I imagine happening by way of a counter reaction, and what what things could could protesters um, and the rest of us do to um, surmount or avoid them? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I would say, like you know, and I'm I'm going to get very hopeful here again. Uh, you know, this you know, as of last February, no one could have predicted that you know the streets of Cairo would be filled with ordinary workers, shopkeepers, um, people who are not jihadist militants, people who are not, you know, enthralled to some, you know, destructive terrorist ideology and would topple one of the, the longest um, tenured um, authoritarian dictators in the region. So, um, you know, there is power in a union. <laughs> um, and I think, and I think that is, you know, uh, less jokingly, I think that is, you know, why you see like Andrew Ross Sorkin wrote a serious column about the protests in today's times, and even the Wall Street Journal has here and there like deigned to recognize them. And I think, you know, it it is partly that threshold has been crossed that it's not like you can't crudely caricature these people past a point. You know, you can only point a, a camera at in the face of so many, you know, guys wearing trucker caps or whatever. And the and this was curiously, I think, what happened in Tahrir Square. You you'll remember that uh, there was a long time when um, you know, there were protests were, were kind of holding the square, but a lot of ordinary Egypt, Egyptians were hanging back as they were watching state television, which said this was all a big Western American plot to uh, topple M Mubarak. And then eventually, like, they were able to talk to protesters, you know, and, and have that moment of recognition of like, well, this is, you know, this is us. <laughs> this is not a, this is not a plot. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the fact, first of all, I would say the fact that the protest has been going on for, what, 19 days now um, is itself a very encouraging sign if, if there was a, a a well choreographed um, investment bank conspiracy to quash it, it probably would have happened by now. And uh, conversely, if if you know the ranks of the protesters would have collapsed into you know sectarianism or you know ideological um, self destruction, that would have happened by now too. I think you know there's a lot of second guessing about this, but I I think tactically the the protesters have been smart not to specify demands. It doesn't give you, first of all, it doesn't give you like a, a traditional interest group purchase in, you know, the tit for tat, you know, Team D and Team R organization of our politics. You know, it, it confuses people, which I think is very healthy. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, I live a few blocks away from there. I've been there about 25 years now. And uh, it's, been, it's been interesting because the people are very organized. It's it's really interesting to see how, like, at certain times, certain things happen, and certain, you know, and there's that sense of um, group amplification. You know, like, if, if people in the back can't hear, you have a caller standing in front, they repeat everything they say, you know, which is, you know, this is nothing new. It's right. just, but it's interesting to see how, like you said, it, it has held up for, you know, to over three weeks. Right. So it's very interesting. Yeah, no, and uh, the comment was there is a tremendous degree of, of self-organization there um, that I think is another thing that, you know, isn't immediately apparent if you're just like, you know, flipping cable channels or, or something. But I, I do think it has, it's it's helps the organization, you know. And also, you know, they, they really do, even though like I've worked in lefty organizations much of my adult life and I, 
I can't stand participatory democracy because <laughs> I've had way too much experience with, with it. But uh, but that that's what they're doing, and it, it is actually very effective um, in keeping you know them focused on both the task at hand and you know from getting diverted from any any number of you know anxieties or or power struggles or what what have you. So can I? I want sure. to jump in and pose it. Just pose a question kind of taking off from your exchange of a moment ago, uh, I was struck by the Andrew Ross Sorkin piece today, mm -hmm. too, because his first piece for the Times was extremely snotty. Uh, you know, he jeered at the protesters, a bunch of hippies, teenagers, drum circles, that kind of thing, which is what all the coverage was doing at first. And now he's, he has a different take, he's more respectful. And I happened to pick up the Daily News yesterday, and Mike Lupica had a column now, the Daily News is more of a working class right. paper than the Times, so it was more sympathetic. But Lupica and Sorkin both made the same argument. I'm not suggesting they collaborated <laughs> on this, but they, they both said, um, well, what, the, what, what these mark. people want, <laughs> what they really want down there, uh, the takeaway here is that they want to see some heads roll. They want to see people on Wall Street right, go to jail. jail. Uh, now, um, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I know I want to see a lot of these people go to jail, but I don't think, I don't think that even begins to exhaust the possibilities here. I think it's interesting both these newspapers, uh, columnists, you know, come out and very, very quickly assert that that's what they want, as if that would be nice to see if they would just have that happen and get rid of a few bad apples and let it go at that, you know? So the question is, and, you know, fully recognizing how in many ways, you know, the Marxist um, argument, you know, may not entirely apply to the United States and its history. The question still is, and, I, and I'm, I'm putting this to you, you know, to what extent will it be possible for this movement to push for a genuinely radical solution that, that we need? Mm -hmm. If there's a kind of ideological void which is the result of, you know, a long history of, of that argument being just devastated and discredited over decades and decades. You know, the left has been hollowed out ideologically, or I should say, you know, our, our political culture has been hollowed out, right. as, as you demonstrate so well, you know, that people could, could say the things they say, they could use words like populist the way they use them, shows an absolute amnesia, you know, uh, that has to do with the way our history is taught, the way economics is taught, the way the media represents our history. So, you know, I, I'm just posing the question, uh, and I, as I, I'm not, you know, surrendering a jot of my optimism. I'm just asking, is You're it possible? <laughs> totally harsh in my mellow. But. Is it, is it, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, because I'm real glad to see you, and I'm glad we're all here, and I'm delighted this is happening downtown. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent uh, this thing can, you know, go well, beyond I mean, just ro having a few heads rolled. You know what I'm saying? Right. No, I, I do. Um, it's an interesting. I mean, look, it's, it's, uh, you know, maybe the ter 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 square analogy is too utopian, but you can also look at, you know, um, the other side in our domestic politics. The Tea Party movement in 2009 was organized or barely organized, really, um, around, you know, these, you know, fallacious ideas, in my view, of, you know, um, distrust of big government, um, wanting um, more tax cuts, insanely, um, and, uh, you know, and professing this generalized um, anxiety about what's going to happen to the middle class under the attack of socialism or whatever, big government, and um, and a you know strongly professed desire to um, revive a kind of participatory democracy in our country, and if you sort of bracket the ideological content of both movements, structurally they're very similar, right? I mean, the, the Occupy Wall Street people are saying that they're you know really alarmed about the hollowing out of our, our middle class, the, the lack of, you know, uh, 
access to credit for ordinary Americans, which is, you know, that also, by the way, is one of the signal issues of the historical pop populist movement. It was all about credit exactly in the same way that we're fighting about these issues now. Um, so, you know, and I, I hate the kind of arguments that like extremes converge or whatever, you know, we're, we'll all muddle through. I don't believe any of that shit, but, uh, but I do think, um, in part because we have a distinctive political culture that has been resistant to hard ideology. Um, and in part because, you know, I, th I think um, a lot of these, and, and I, I guess the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street comparison sort of breaks down when you look at, you know, the, the kind of, super, you know, all the stuff that people make fun of, the, the drum circles or the tri tri cornered hats in the case of the Tea Party, like there, you know, there has been a um, and uh, and the other obvious big caveat, of course, is like the Tea Party movement was helped enormously by Fox News <laughs> and the Koch Foundation and all that. We can kind of stipulate that for just about any movement on the right, anyway. But um, I think you know. It's early to say in the case of Occupy Wall Street, but um, there are emerging ideological um, glimmers or penumbras, as the Supreme Court might say, of uh, having to do with you know control over your work, which is you know a traditional kind of socialist idea in certain ways, but also a populist one. Like you should be able to you know not have. Um, you know, a, a robo-signing law firm take over your home because you've lost your job. Um, and that, you know, that goes to all of the, you know, the heart of the American dream as we've commonly understood it, home ownership and hard work. And those are values that are there, you know, for the left to claim if it wants to. It just has to think about these things a little differently and, you know, not, um, you know, and, and in some ways, like I'm as strong as the Occupy Wall Street movement is here, I'm curious to see how it's going to transplant to other cities. You know, LA is having an event, Washington, where I live, which is not like the rest of America, trust me, but, um, and I think Boston and a few, you know, as, as it spreads across the country, I think you'll get a different kind of ideological um, component to it that I think would be good and welcome in, in certain ways, but I, I don't know what it would be. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. Yeah, um, about a year and a half ago, I was in a building of the NYU Business School, the Stern School, uh, from which mm -hmm. my sister graduated. And um, I saw in the lounge area they had a video screen on the wall, like a tele screen, uh, with videos announcing various events. For one of the events, it said uh, in large type, um, uh, become the elite or be part of it. just struck me. Wow. It struck me at the time. It's a mission that, statement. Yeah, <laughs> this is not something that I would have expected to see. The uh, university. And in, in NYU, it's, you, you work there. It's a, technically a public university, right? No. no. Are no? you kidding? Bite your when? tongue. Uh, I thought it's like, like, I, never like Monsanto. All right, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but I mean, it struck me immediately. Uh, this is not something I would probably would not have seen, say, 20 years ago, yeah. even in the, the 80s, the so-called decade of greed. Um, and uh, it also reminded me of a book I had been looking at in the NYU library recently by Theodore Geiser, Tragic America. <laughs> yeah. It was written in 1931 at, uh, in pre-FDR U.S. Depression times, and. Um, he, he goes on about the U.S. developing a caste system, to, say like India, <coughs> and he said this is this is where we're headed, you know. And, and so it reminded me of that, and yeah. also a book called The Revolt of the Elites, which is written out. by my graduate advisor, Chris Furlan. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> um, and so my question is, do you, as, as I get the sense, and I've heard Gore Vidal speak about this also, that the ruling class in America, the rich and the very rich, the ruling rich families and so on, are moving away from the sense of noblesse oblige they had before, or something much uh, worse, if that's possible. 
and fascistic. And um, Vidal described this to that they don't believe really, that the newer people, the younger generations of the predators, don't have a memory of revolution, and they feel very safe that there's no danger. They might be right about this. No danger in the West of revolution or even be a reform now. So the the question is, uh, are they getting worse? Right. Are are the elites in in the United States getting worse and verging on a quasi fascistic outlook because of the lack of a, a countervailing um, a demotic or populist tendency? Um, and you know, the, sh the short answer, I guess, would be yes. <laughs> but I. <laughs> I don't know that I would go, you know, fascism like capitalist and worker. It's one of those charged 20th century terms. And uh, and I don't, you know, I, I think we tend to lose sight, too, of how, um, you know, just as the left can be in disciplines, you know, the, <clears throat> the rich has a, a kind of its own, you know, uh, cast of professional hirelings who tend, you know, they serve in Congress <laughs> and the Supreme Court and, and kind of, uh, you know, have a, 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 what I'm saying, I guess, is that, you know, the strict definition of fascism is that uh, the state gets privatized. Um, and I'm not, Come, you know, I guess maybe I'm just too sentimental. <laughs> I, I don't quite believe that that's that's what's happening um, here. Um, I would, and I would hate to be proven wrong, but uh, but I do think there is, um, and I don't know how much I ever bought into the. You know, you have to remember that Gore Vidal also himself comes from old money and likes the idea of noblesse oblige for his own reason. So um, I've I've always thought that the I you know. So it's an interesting argument because uh, you know a lot of people say that FDR was a much more effective um, president in an economic depression than Obama has proved to be because FDR was a class trader. He knew exactly how the aristocracy thought. He knew how to outflank them and to you know flatter them when he needed to and to kick their ass when he needed to, um, which is also kind of depressing. Um, but. Um, I think that um, what you're also witnessing, um, and a lot of people have written on this too, is uh, you know the, as the capitalist economy goes global, so does the you know capitalist oligarchy, and there's a lot less attachment to um, you know notions of citizenship or public service in in most Western countries, um, and. Certainly, um, apart from you know endowing medical research, and you know you're not going to. It's it's interesting. You're not going to see um, you know FDR type figures. It's it's almost unthinkable, right? You can't think of uh, you know what we have by way of of silver spoon aspiring presidential leaders are Mitt Romney and John Huntsman, who are weirdly both Mormon, and that's the cover story of the new Harpers, but. Uh, um, it's yeah, it's a very different ethos now, and I'm I I hesitate to call it quasi-fascist, but I I am disturbed by it. I was um, interested in what you said about the school saying become part of the new elite because the word elite has such negative connotations yes. in our in our culture, and I was um, struck. Uh, by your subtitle, Predator, mm -hmm. and the response it got this morning, I'm sure that we'll get all along uh, or in the future. Um, I know we've talked about what happened to the kind of 19th century language of revolt, where people who were revolting would call their enemies by their proper names, like right. Predator, I don't think they use that word, but they use uh, parasitical plutocrat, these kinds of things, and how that language has completely disappeared or almost disappeared uh, from our language today. And I was thinking about this relationship with the idea of the elite, um, that we're not, if you used other terms, I'm very interested in the terms like, as you know, taste, judgment, distinction, discrimination, and aesthetic terms, you're also considered an elitist. If you make any kind of distinction, right. um, you're an elitist. Um, and it's always something bad. Now, I, as this 
because I'm just thinking about this off the top of my head, this part of it. I wonder if there's this name, if it's considered name calling, it's somehow rude in this way that you're not allowed to do if you're calling the upper class by what we would think is the proper name, that somehow that's making some kind of a judgment mm -hmm. that you're not supposed to do today, which seems quite bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering... Well, yeah, and we've, we have inherited this kind of impoverished, um, you know, you don't know what to call, you know, I, I, my, up here I've just been stumbling over terms like capitalist and oligarchs and plutocrats. So, you know, there's a, you know, you use a, the term plutocrat just, you know, it summons to mind like a, a fat guy in a top hat. It just seems antiquated somehow. And when you, you know, like the, the real lords of our economy are like Steve Jobs or Eric Schmidt, who are these like, you know, lean kind of, you know, um, and they all sort of deliberately dress down. Um, and I don't, you know, there, it's true. We don't have a language that effectively describes, you know, the new economic elite. As to the term elite itself, what's, what struck me about this gentleman's anecdote is, um, yeah, elite in, um, aesthetic debates or cultural debates is always bad. And Sarah Palin herself and scores of other uh, people on the right have always called liberals elitists, um, which I'll come back to that. <laughs> but uh, um, but the economic elite has no problem with that term, I, I think, as is illustrated there. And I was also reminded, uh, I think it was Clinton's re-election campaign in 96, whenever the, the whole dumb um, Dan Quayle thing broke out about... Potato? No, it was uh, Murphy Brown. Uh, Murphy Brown. Right. Yeah, I, it's hard to explain to younger people today, but there was an actual moment where the vice presidential nominee on the Republican Party blamed the LA riots on a sitcom character. It really happened, trust me. Um, and in his, anyway, in his response to this absurdity, like, um, Bill Clinton got up, of course, in a crowd of Hollywood fundraisers and said, you know, Dan Quayle calls, you know, you all the cultural elite. And I wanted my whole life to be a member of the cultural elite. And, you know, that's just one of those moments where you just, I at least lean back and think, fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, because, you know, I, Yes, the, the problem is like, and I actually wrote my first little book, the pamphlet that's long out of print on this, sort of on the same <coughs> subject, like the idea of making any kind of cultural distinction, aesthetic judgment has become demonized. And you have this weird situation where like, you know, if, if you're engaging in cultural debate, you have to be like the purest kind of utopian socialist. You have to like admit that we are all, you know, working, thinking, writing on, a continually level playing field or else you're you're you know all but dressed up in a wig and a petticoat or whatever and made you know made a target of of uh you know this dumb invective that has not you know nothing to do you know and again I, it's a long digression but like as you know <laughs> making cultural distinctions is integral to like a democratic culture um, it is not in any way, um, does not support the plutocracy. Um, and it, it's again, another one of these signal confusions, like, and I said, I was going to come back to the liberal elitist thing. <laughs> um, you know, we all sort of know from our, our political discourse, what an, a liberal elitist is supposed to be. They're supposed to be like, you know, hyper obsessed with correct political language and, and, uh, you know, smug about their consumption habits. They go to, you know, they bring their old, own bags to Whole Foods and, you know, they listen to exotic ethnic music. And it's all about consumption, right? It, it you know, it just sort of goes in a weird way back to what we were talking about earlier. It's, it has nothing to do with, you know, the formation of a cohesive elite. It's just like people who are well-educated and prosperous tend to buy certain kinds of shit. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, and part of my whole confusion in life stems from like, you know, I, I was raised by liberals in 
the upper Midwest where we were surrounded by Republicans. <laughs> like, it never dawned on me. I, I was outnumbered, but I never felt like I was an elite. I was getting beat up. You know? <laughs> and uh, it was only when I started working and left journalism that I just, I, the, the penny dropped and I met people who were uh, members of, you know, there is such a thing actually as a liberal elite and they run a lot of liberal institutions, but um, but it is not an economic descriptor that has any value. And if liberalism was about economics, which it hasn't been for about 15 years, um, or democratic ec economics, a small d, um, we would laugh at that term, right? <laughs> you know, you, no one would call FDR an elitist, even though he was an aristocrat, because he was... He, he used that language. He said, you know, I, you know, I welcome the hatred of the bankers. You know, if, if Obama were to say that, he would have to fire the entire Council of Economic Advisors, right? Um, so anyway. I was going to say, you just touched on, a, um, just touch on something that I, um, maybe other people try to spin in, I don't know, maybe you have some more insight on it, but it seems to me that the right has been so much better at hijacking language in the sense that, you know, you decide we're going to say that Obama's a socialist or this is Obamacare, and I, I just, it's just shocking to me how effective that hijacking can be, that it, you know. Yeah, it is very effective, and I, I think it's, a complicated question to explain how it, how all that rhetorical initiative has fallen to the right. It has to do with l lots of historical forces, like the white working class falling into the Reagan camp, and so you know, at, at that moment, it became credible. You know, circa 1968, you know, Richard Nixon could never have been described as a populist. <laughs> he was like at most like a an opportunistic law and order guy. Even though in economic policies, I will point out, like he uh, gave us your in income tax credit, like OSHA. He, you know, I'm not defending him. <laughs> I'm just saying it's a very interesting um, flip because you have you had someone like Richard Nixon who was entirely bankrolled by the business establishment, who was able to, you know, it was a Democratic majority in Congress, but. Um, and then you had Reagan, who, who ran as this genial man of the people, was endorsed by unions, and uh, you know, pried away this critical blue-collar base of the Democratic Party, and uh, just punished it. <laughs> um, you know, the the increase of, of wealth inequality. It, it actually is continuous from the late Carter years through um, now, but yeah, you know, there's a big spike when when Reagan takes charge. And I think language allows that, definitely. Um, I have a question sort of about the work of criticism, um, mm -hmm. which I suppose would be, um, we have a lot of the tools to understand what's going on, you know, variations on Marx. There's a whole mm -hmm. academic field of studying precarious labor, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, criticism, as you've been describing, is hard to do because of the language problem. And in some ways, Occupy Wall Street seems successful because they haven't really said anything. Sort of said, we hate Wall Street, and everyone's like, yeah, me too. Right. You know, because everyone does. Um, but it, it's not making a lot of points, you know, and it's hard to go on television, for instance, and say anything intelligent um, and not just play the Democratic Republican game. Right. So I was sort of curious um, where you see the best values of attack. Um, the question is, what is the role of criticism um, in sort of refining the goals of, of general protest movements like Occupy Wall Street and what are the best uh, venues? Um, boy, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, criticism is, is wherever it's conducted, um, never valued. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, the only reason I do it, as I was suggesting earlier, is a sort of self-administered therapy. I think you, and, and you can force out these contradictions and tensions that don't normally see the light of day. And, and I think wherever you do that is, you know, it's productive certainly for the writer. I don't know in terms of political organizing 
I, you know, I think political actors at all levels have to, it would be good for their souls to think more critically, but I don't know how to make them. Um, sorry. <laughs> You're very critical of the Orwellian transformation that's occurred with our language. Mm -hmm. But I think you've got to look a little more at what exactly language is and does. It not only permits us to describe things, it permits us to understand Thank things. You. And the lack of certain words, or the transformation of certain words which were widely used before into words which seem silly and old-fashioned mm -hmm. today, uh, keeps people from understanding certain things. So that the word capitalist, for example. I thought that's where you're going. It appears all the time in Barron's. Mm -hmm. Fortune magazine. A capitalist tool is the, is the port words, of These words are used by capitalists speaking with other capitalists mm -hmm. about themselves, their problems. It mm -hmm. never appears in the Daily News or the Post. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, very occasionally in the Times. And so it's very difficult to think of rich people in terms of their function mm -hmm. and in terms of their relationship of to those who you're calling poor and who are predominantly workers and putting intellectual work. Mm -hmm. Now, until we have the concepts which enables us to think about our problems, we're going to be in no situation to understand them and therefore to change them. And it doesn't help to just treat you know, certain words which make some people feel uncomfortable because of the barrage of propaganda against using those words by their media, by their system of education, uh, by their intellectuals. Why should we give in to that instead of trying to create a vocabulary which actually helps us think and change what needs to be changed. I'm I'm all for creating a vocabulary. I'm I I think you know we, we're probably just um, and we can discuss this at greater length later. But uh, you know I I I feel like um, we need a kind of ideology that is more expansive than Marxist language has traditionally. Um, permitted. Um, and I'm, I have no trouble. I, I use capitalist all the time in the book, and I use workers all the time in the book. It's, it doesn't bother me. Um, but I, I think, you know, part, part of the problem with language is both that we, we lose the meanings of historical word or historical descriptors, but the, like I was saying with reference to, you know, the, the global knowledge elite, um, the words don't always match up to our historical moment. And I think it's kind of, to fall back on older descriptors can be a kind of failure to do what you're describing, to, to create new ways for people to understand our plights and our situation. So I think we can both agree in broad conceptual terms and um, anyone who wants to use capitalist and, and worker that's totally fine by me. <laughs> I just think we we should be able to, you know, understand. Oh, sorry, um, that there's there are other historical forces in play, and it, it hurts to say this. I know, but like um, socialism has not only become, you know, this curse word in American politics, but it's it's not the most vital historical alternative at, at this moment. And we have to figure out what it, what that means and what the consequences of that are, so. Well, and yet uh, half the American public, uh, prof you know, is, is, is open to a socialist alternative to capitalism. The, the problem you're raising is a fundamental sort of propaganda problem. You have to use the language that's current in the universe you're writing in and the one in which people are raised. So it may be necessary to sort of reinvent the wheel with a new vocabulary that makes some of the same points, you know? Uh, because you, you, uh, any writer is up against that problem. Yeah, you, know? you have to speak to people where they are, otherwise you're speaking past them or, um, you know, not engaging them. And that's something, like, as, as a writer, I wrestle with all the time. Um, it's just the nature of the work. Anyway. Okay. Um, but coming back to what he said about are they are the rich getting worse? Her comment about uh, critics and yours about language too. Don't we also have to when we think of language name names and talk yes. about and 
talk about the billionaires. I mean, people like, I don't think of Steve Jobs or Eric Schmidt. I think of the Cokes, the, the Broads, mm -hmm. the people who uh, are trying to in, infiltrate our election system, who are trying to influence our educational system. Um, and you could go on. I mean, taking over prisons and so on. Um, yeah, there's that's a, a little far out, but, but and the bankers, I mean, who have, who have caused so much damage. No, it's an interesting... Of, Air, of Goldman Sachs, for example, who are these people right. who are just going their way and enjoying their lives and while the rest of us are paying so much? I mean, it seems to me that's where the focus of the, you know, criticism of the rich... Right. So the question is, should we, you know, be focus more on naming names, and I absolutely agree. And I think one interesting instance of that was in 2009, you'll remember there was all this sort of, and again, this speaks volumes in my view about where we are right now, all this um, fretting in the mainstream press, and this was inadvertently what got me writing the online column in the first place, about uh, the AIG bailouts and like, you know, Obama gave, you know, what was described at the time as a fiery populist speech, and there was all of a sudden, like, all this hand-wringing on cable pundit shows and in establishment newspapers of, like, well, you know, this is the moment of populist rebellion, what's going to, you know, the, the pitchforks are, are coming out of the closet and the torches are being lit. And, of course, not only did that not happen at the time, though it could be happening now, I guess, but... Um, I, I always marveled, and this this is true of myself at this moment as well. Like, can can you name the top executives at AIG who were responsible for uh, the collapse of the company and who were subsequently bailed out? And again, what does that tell you about the way we conduct political discourse in this country and the way the media operates? You know, AIG was just this blank, impenetrable obelisk out there that we all of a sudden had to bail out and all the focus was on like people who were upset about the bailouts and that you know that wasn't a meaningful transaction at all the meaningful transaction was the actual bailout um and we we still don't know because of the way the tarp law was written how a lot of that unfolded so it's it is a very i, I agree you make a very good point um i wonder You've talked a lot about the uh, language and how it's very hard to name. I wonder to what degree that is uh, political correctness taken to the bottom of conclusion to the point where the people on Wall Street, like you say, don't say anything. Right. They can't say anything. There are no terms, and they've grown up with that not being. No, it's true. We don't. We don't have. We've sort of been alluding to this. We've, we've inherited a very impoverished vocabulary to talk about issues of social class. But, but yeah. it was also used, the political correctness movement, as I understand mm -hmm. and certainly as I experienced, was used to silence people. Sure. You're talking and about academic political correctness? You're talking about within the academy? Is that what you mean? Um, I, <clears throat> That's what it I really sort of is. Across the board, <clears throat> in, in general usage, in specific usage, it's, words have been stripped of their meaning or demonized to the can't use them. Mm -hmm. So so now there's a whole group of people who've come of age without that vocabulary. And now they, they feel whatever they feel in terms of frustration and anger, but they don't actually have the words to put to it because they're they've grown up with those words or or yeah, or, though I would, direct language being mm -hmm. Right. I that that is a point I would agree with. The political correctness thing is a little complicated, but I think um what we've lost in both, and I would say both the left and the right are, are guilty in different ways. Um, you know, we we had a long period, um, sort of beginning in the late 1980s, where identity was like the great valorized category in leftist discussion, which is not, it's an important thing when you're talking about gay politics and racial politics and, and feminist politics. You don't want to dismiss it. but. Um, you do, I, it always struck me at the time, you know, when I was in grad school, say, you know, the, the sort of, uh, rote formulation of the critical theory project was, uh, race, gender, and class, and class uh, always brought up the rear and never made complete sense, and <clears throat> you often heard that, which this still drives me crazy, the term classism, as though it's a category of you know, irrational discrimination that people have to be educated out of, that the rich just have to be nicer somehow. <laughs> 
and you don't remedy material inequalities that way. Um, it's a different project, and it, it requires, you know, expropriating the expropriators. Let's say <laughs> it, it does require, you know, talking about you know hard material issues that affect us collectively. And and when you don't have that collective language, and this probably goes back to I see you nodding. <laughs> you don't have that collective language. It is very hard to get to that analytical point. Well, you know, the argument has been made, and I'm, I find it completely convincing, <clears throat> that the rise of identity politics in the academy, which actually started in the 70s, was consciously or not uh, motivated by a desire not to talk about class or economics, right? And, and in fact, if you saw where all the money from the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation was going for research projects, it was all going into uh, gender and, and race stuff. And then political correctness comes out of that. You can't call a woman abroad, you know, or you can't. Which Mark has always wanted to do. <laughs> that doesn't. That that is completely outside the whole universe of of calling rich people predators, you know, or or just you know, calling a spade a spade in terms of economic exploitation. So definitely, the left is is. Uh, been complicit in this whole process of depriving us of a useful language and way of conception. And it's also worth pointing out that that's also the time when the union movement is in steep decline, both in um, the American economy and um, on the in the left liberal side of our politics. Um, I don't think that's. Um, I think that's as um, decisive as foundation money going through the academy. Okay, uh, last question, I guess. Um, yeah, going back to where the, <coughs> there was a book uh, written a long time ago called The Power of Heat by C. Wright. Yes, Mayo. I quoted in my introduction. Yes. Yeah. So long ago. <laughs> 51. <laughs> so it's like yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I've read it, it seems like a real attempt at a scientific analysis of the upper class in America, mm -hmm. the ruling class, in particular the ruling family. Uh, ruling corporations, um, and uh, I was wondering uh, if you think there's been a follow-up to that book, because it, it seemed to me, and I could be wrong, but that sort of real hard scientific analysis, sociological analysis of the, the upper controlling class in America has not been done since then. No, I think, I think the time is definitely ripe, um, and I think it would answer a lot of these questions naming the names and, and figuring out like who really controls um, you know the, not only the wealth but the <laughs> institutions of our culture and I think uh, you often get these kind of you know Forbes will do their list of the 500 wealthiest um, people in the world or in the United States and uh, there's you know it's useful to know their names but you really need to know what they think and um, and you know how they view their social obligations and what institutions they control and all the stuff that Mills wrote about. Um, and I think, yeah, it's again, you could say C. Wright Mills had the concept of social class, you know, handily at his disposal. It was like the, one of the you know long ago when there was a discipline called sociology that still existed in. in uh, the American Academy, uh, people wrote about social class and people understood what it was. And he was a maverick at the time, even. No, that's true. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember that book. We, we, yeah. had, we, we yeah. had her here, actually. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Could you uh, repeat the title and the author? Shadow, uh, Shadow Link by Janine Waddell, right. and she'll be speaking at the Hunto meeting uh, Thursday night, 7 p.m. General Society Library, 44th Street or so, just That's west fun. of Grand Central. Yeah. Thank you. And how long have you been married to her? <laughs> I'm going to go myself. No, she's great. Yeah, she no, she she's spoke great. here at the bookstore when that book came out. <laughs> Well, listen, this was really uh, fascinating. So thanks, thanks a million. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it.